Hello, I'm Professor Simon Hazlitt and I want to talk to you about how to examine uh, radial area for scientific study. Now, radial area can, are commonly viewed um, for routine analysis using a transmitted light microscope such as this one here. But for more taxonomic work, looking at uh, their fine detail of their skeletons and so on, uh, we often use scanning electron microscopy. Um, now, there's a slightly different uh, technique in processing the, the sediment. Uh, for a scanning electron microscope, you need to mount the material on these little uh, uh, SEM stubs. Now, the sediment is uh, pipetted onto uh, the, the stub with the radial area in the sediment. Um, and usually, you put a little bit of gum or a sticky um, film on the stubs first. Then the sediment goes on. But for a scanning electron microscope, you need to coat it um, so that, the, so that the, actually you can actually view the fossils in, in, a, in, a, in an SE, SEM. Um, and in this case, you might be able to see that the uh, coating material is gold, but there are other coating materials you can use as well, and you need a sputter coater to actually coat the, coat the fossils. And you can see for each one of those uh, stubs that were going to be used for the SEM, the, the full label of the, of the core and the section in the core and the, and the sa centimetre interval for each one of those samples it is written on there very carefully. And we can see from the, the cover of this that this particular suite of samples uh, are from Ocean Drilling Program Hole 677A. So SEM is one um, way of looking at, uh, uh, at radial area, but for routine counting of faunas and assemblages for paleo-oceanographic and paleoclimatic studies, then we would use a transmitted light microscope. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the transmitted light microscope, um, I'll just run through the, the various parts of it so you know what I'm talking about. Um, at the top here, we have the microscope head. Now, so on some models, you can have a, um, an extra bit here which enables you to at attach a camera, and you can have a video camera up here which can feed into a computer and so on, which enables you to take um, photographs of what you're looking at very quickly um, as, an arc as, as a record of what you've seen. Now, the, um, the head itself, then you've got the eyepieces, the um, optics, and quite often you can um, focus those individually as well using these dials. And, of course, um, you can adjust the width um, depending on how far your eyes are apart from one another. Um, so that's the microscope head. Now, underneath that, we have the, the lenses, the objectives of the microscope. And quite often there, there's more than one and uh, of different magnifications. The shortest one is usually the lowest magnification, um, which in this case is a times four. Um, and then we've got a times ten, and so on, right the way up to the largest one, which is a times a hundred. Um, and you can see that they rotate on this uh, rotating um, hinge here. Now below that we have the, the microscope stage. Now this is where you put your microscope slide and, all, and um, also you've got these dials here which enable you to move the microscope slide around the stage. And there are um, rulers on here which enable you to actually uh, met a record where you've been uh, on the stage with your microscope slide. Um, at the back here we have the focusing mechanism. Um, the big wheel is a major, focus, major focusing and, the, and the, the smaller inner wheel is for more fine uh, tuning of the focusing. Now, right at the bottom, oh, sorry, underneath the stage, we also have a lever which controls what we call the iris diaphragm. Now, that's a, like a, a camera aperture which controls how much light is let in underneath and through the slide and, uh, and affects how much light you see and the brightness of the light that you see coming through the optics at the top. Um, and right at the bottom here, we have the light source. Now, on these electronic microscopes, um, it's simply a, uh, an electric uh, uh, light. But on the old, more old-fashioned microscopes, that could be a mirror that you um, have focused sunlight through. Uh, and often there is a, a light intensity control as well, which is this, this sliding um, button down here on the right. So that's the, the microscope. And we would want to uh, place the microscope slide on there. Now, in this um, stack of microscope cabinets, uh, microscope slide cabinets here, um, 
I've got my collection of ocean drilling program uh, radiolarian slides that I've worked on as part of my own research. And this particular tray, which I've just pulled out at random, is from Ocean Drilling Program uh, Site 677 from the Eastern Pacific Ocean. And uh, I've got many samples from this site uh, and have looked at samples um, over spanning several hundred thousand years at that particular site. I'm just going to take one out at random uh, and put it under the microscope. Now, when you put a microscope slide under the, uh, the objective for the first time, you want to be really careful that you don't smash the microscope slide. So what I would advise you is to actually, before you focus in on it, is to not look down the optics, but to look at the stage and to bring the slide up as close to the lens as it will go. And then you've only, you can only um, focus away from it. So if I look down now and focus away um, the radial area come into focus and I haven't um, risked breaking my slide. And that's particularly the case when you're on the, the bigger objectives where there's a greater risk of actually putting your objective through, through your slide and ruining your slide and also potentially ruining your objective as well. Um, so we can look at the radial areas like this and I would recommend that you, ab you adopt a systematic approach to looking at radial area under the microscope like this. I tend to start in one of the corners of the slide and work my way across the, the slide, going down then systematically and back across. And if you want to look at the entire slide, I suggest you do that in a pathway all the way through. Now quite often, for, for statistical reasons, you really only need to count about 300 radial area. And on a slide like this, I can tell just by looking down there that there are several thousand radial area on this particular slide. And I wouldn't want to count all of them, so I don't need to count the entire slide. Now, depending on which processing uh, technique you use, you can use, there is a, a technique in which you can randomly settle radial area onto the, onto the microscope slide. So it doesn't really matter which part of it you look at, it will be a random sample. But on strewn samples, which you, which, um, you simply pipette sediment onto, there may be clumps of sediment on the, on the, cover, on the, on the microscope slide, which means you'd need to ad adopt a systematic approach to, to looking at the microscope slide. For example, if you clump uh, pipette sediment into the center of a microscope slide, you might want to um, examine a, a transect along the, along the top edge or the bottom edge of a slide, then a transect through the middle of the slide, and then perhaps a transect halfway between the two. That way, if during your pipetting you've um, inadvertently um, allowed um, preferential distribution of the radiator, such as the big ones going to the edge of the slide, the small ones remaining in the center, or vice versa, then you will capture um, all the different components by adopting an approach like that. So that's how you um, uh, look at a uh, look at radial area through transmitted light on a microscope like this.